Our summer reading theme this year is a universe of stories. And as we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing this year, it was the time for us to learn more about space and about cosmology. And we were lucky enough to be able to partner with Science for the Public to bring us tonight's fantastic program. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you for coming. I wanted to thank the library for supporting science. And I wanted to thank Science for the Public. Thank you so much. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and we are delighted to work again with uh, Robbins Library to bring the lecture to you tonight. Um, Science for the Public is very pleased to share this with Robbins and the opportunity to present our guest speaker, Tracy sure. Slatyer, Professor of Physics at MIT. Dr. Slatyer's work involves uh, particle physics, cosmology, and astrophysics. She's a leader in the effort to understand dark matter, and that is the most elusive feature of our universe that fascinates scientists and the general public. Tonight, Dr. Slatyer will explain why dark matter is one of the hardest problems in astrophysics, and she'll describe her innovative uh, research, which is really interesting, and work for which she has received multiple awards. And now, we're very honored to welcome Professor Tracy Slatner. Welcome. Well, thanks very much, Yvonne. Thanks very much to Science for the Public and Robbins Library for hosting me. I'm um, very happy to tell you all a bit about my research and about the problems that I have the privilege to think about as my day job. So what I want to tell you about here is dark matter why it's a question that I and many other people are interested in, and how you might try to determine what dark matter is by looking at the sky, at our galaxy, and at the universe beyond. So I want to start out by talking about the dark side of the problem, which as you may find familiar. Um, so I first want to talk about you. Why do we think that dark matter exists at all? How do we know what we think we know about dark matter? Then, and as you'll see, that will tell us a lot of interesting things about dark matter, but leave a lot of open questions. So then I want to move on to talking about the light side of the problem, whether we can see visible signals of dark matter in radiation coming from our galaxy and beyond. And I'm going to give you one specific example. So I've worked on a range of topics in this general category. So I'm just going to tell you about one puzzle, which is currently um, causing a lot of uh, discussion among scientists in my field about how if we look at our galaxy in gamma rays, we see various structures that we don't understand, some of which might tell us something about the dark matter of the universe. OK, so let's begin with what, what is dark matter. So the left panel is what we think we know about dark matter. And in the subsequent slides, I'll go ahead and tell you why we believe that these things are true. So it's a bit more than 80% of all the matter in the universe by mass. We, it has mass, so it gravitates. And that's how we know basically everything we know about dark matter is by looking at its gravitational effects. So that's the matter part of the, whoops. Apologies. That's, so that's the matter part of the dark matter. But on the other hand, it doesn't seem to interact with light. Ordinary matter interacts with light. That's how we see everything in this room. That's how we see each other. But dark matter, as far as we can tell, it doesn't scatter light. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't absorb light. It doesn't have a color. So it might actually better be called transparent matter rather than dark matter. If it interacts with the other particles that we know about, not just light, but protons and neutrons and neutrinos and electrons and positrons, if it interacts with them, it does so very weakly. We haven't yet detected any positive signals of those interactions, although I'll talk about searches for such interactions later in this talk. And these properties are enough to tell us that, as far as we know, it's not made up of any known particles. All the stuff that you learned about in school, that matter is made up of atoms, which is made up of electrons and protons and neutrons, which are made up of quarks, none of that applies to dark matter, as best as we can tell. So that leaves a lot of open questions. What is it made from? Are we looking at one kind of new particle? Are we looking at many different kinds of new particle? Are we looking at something more exotic? Are we looking at tiny little black holes pervading the universe? That's a real live possibility for what dark matter could be. Where did it come from? Why is it 
of the matter in the universe. I said its interactions are weak, but does it have any non-gravitational interactions at all? Um, if so, what do those interactions look like? How does it behave? And I could keep listing questions like this for a long time. So um, I'm going to try to, by the end of this talk, I'd like you to understand where these pieces of information come from and some of how we're trying to explore these open questions. So let's begin with the former. So the puzzle of dark matter goes back almost a century at this point. And the first time the word was actually used in the scientific literature, as far as I understand it, was in a study by an astronomer called Fritz Zwicky. So as is appropriate for this Universal Stories theme, Zwicky was looking at the sky with a telescope and he was trying to understand structures called galaxy clusters. So we live in the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is just one of many galaxies inhabiting this larger cluster of galaxies. And we can look at other galaxy clusters scattered out throughout the universe. They're the largest structures in the universe. So he was looking at a particular galaxy cluster called Coma, and he wanted to answer the question of how much mass is present in this galaxy cluster. So how, how do you weigh a galaxy cluster? Your kitchen scales are not up to the job. <laughs> so, we, so there are a couple of methods that you might imagine. So one method is to say, OK, let's um, try to estimate the mass of a galaxy. Let's count how many galaxies there are in the cluster. Let's add them up. That'll give us an answer for the mass of the galaxy. Okay. But ideally, as a scientist, you'd like to have more than one way of doing a given measurement. You'd like to do it a couple of different ways and check that you get the same answer. So method two is to say, well, um, the gravitational pull of the galaxies is determined by how much mass there is in the rest of the cluster. So we can look at how fast the galaxies are moving under the gravity of the rest of the cluster, and we can use that to infer how much total mass there is. So as Wiki did this calculation, you know, did it both ways, got an answer both ways. The problem is that the second method gives an answer that's about 500 times larger than the first method. So that is a, a little bit of a discrepancy. So um, Zwicky, uh, so this is a picture of a smaller scale. This is a picture of our Milky Way galaxy taken from a point in Australia where I'm from originally. So this band of stars across the sky is what our galaxy looks like. And this is an artist's impression for what our galaxy would look like if we were outside it. And this blue spot is roughly where the Earth is located relative to the center of our galaxy. So our galaxy is the spiraling disk. We're about 25,000 light years out from the center of the galaxy along one of the arms. When we see this band on the sky, we're basically looking across the broad part of this disk. When we look away from this, we're looking at other parts of the sky. So, OK, so as Wiki had this, so this, and this is the next place, observations of the Milky Way galaxy, of our galaxy, and of similar galaxies were where the next big piece of evidence in the search for dark matter came from. OK, so circa's Wiki, we had established that there appears to be a lot more mass in galaxy clusters as measured by the gravitational pull than you would have expected just by adding up the, in, the intermediate galaxies. So that suggests that there's some kind of matter which is in between the galaxies in galaxy clusters, some kind of non-luminous or dark matter, as Wiki called it, dark matter in his papers. But at this point, we weren't imagining that this was some kind of new particle or anything. We're thinking you know, maybe it's like old burnt out stars or rocks drifting in the space between the galaxies. So, then studies of galaxies in the 1970s um, caused people to question that picture a little bit. So in the 1970s, um, an astronomer named Vera Rubin and her colleagues Ford and Thonard decided that just as Wiki had measured how fast galaxies were moving in galaxy clusters, they would measure how fast stars and gas clouds were moving around galaxies. And what they found was that the outer regions of galaxies were spinning faster than expected. Our, our, that spiral disk I showed you was spinning around. Um, and you can measure how fast the different parts of the disk are rotating. Now, the expect, and you can work out how you expect them to rotate based on the mass that we can measure in the galaxy. Most of the mass that we can measure is concentrated in the central region, where there's a lot of stars, there's a lot of gas. That's represented by this big yellow blob, this plot. So this is um, showing like stars and gas clouds in the disk of the galaxy that I just showed you. Now, under our standard theories of gravity, what we would expect is that the particles, the stars and gas clouds that are closest into the center, move fastest around the spiral. And the ones far out, gravity's weaker out there, they move very slowly. So the, this is just like planets orbiting the sun. It's exactly the same physics. The ones that are further out take a lot longer to go around the sun and move more slowly. But in fact, when you observe these galaxies, what happens is that it seems like 
the test particles, the stars and gas clouds close to the center of the galaxy, are moving at pretty much the same speed as the ones far, far out from the center of the galaxy. So um, that suggests that these particles out a long distance from the center of the galaxy are, expecting st are experiencing stronger gravity than you would expect. Now that could mean a couple of different things. It could mean that our theories of gravity are just wrong. Maybe the theories of gravity that work so well to explain how the solar system behaves just stop working when you're trying to use them to explain a whole galaxy. That would be exciting. We have to revise our theories of gravity. The other possibility, and in this case dark matter is kind of the more prosaic possibility, is that there's a lot of extra matter out here that we just can't see. But in this case, so in this case it's not just saying there's extra matter in the galaxy, it's saying there's extra matter and it's spread out to much larger distances than the visible stuff that we can observe. So that's one possibility that works, that our galaxy, and we see this in many galaxies, so in fact all galaxies, are embedded in what we call a dark matter halo. So this is like a giant cloud of a new kind of matter, uh, in which, and the visible galaxy is just embedded at its center. Now the fact that this matter is distributed so differently from the ordinary matter suggests that it has some differences in behavior to the ordinary matter. Because the ordinary matter, spin, it collapses, it spins down into this bright disk at the center, and the dark matter doesn't seem to do that. So one possibility that works is if the dark matter only has gravitational interactions, so it can't radiate light, it can't absorb light, it can't emit light, it can't bind together through electromagnetic bonds, then that stops this cloud of dark matter from collapsing down into a dense and compact disk like the visible matter does. In order for the visible matter to collapse into this disk, it needs to have electromagnetic interactions. So this leads you to hypothesize, maybe there's a form of matter that doesn't experience electromagnetic interactions, and there's a cloud of this stuff surrounding every galaxy in the universe. Okay, so that, um, but, and then there's the other possibility that I mentioned that maybe, Maybe that's wrong, maybe there's no extra matter, but maybe um, there's a change to gravity. So then you might ask, okay, how do I tell the difference between these two possibilities? How do, how do I tell the difference between gravity doesn't get weaker as fast as I would expect as I move away from an area with a lot of mass, and the mass is much more broadly distributed when I first expect it? And the basic problem with this is that the dark matter and the vis if it is dark matter, then the dark matter and the visible matter are, are attracted to each other by gravity. So they're going to end up in more or less the same places. So it's going to be hard to tell the difference between dark matter and a difference in the gravitational effects of visible matter. But there's a solution to this. We've just hypothesized that the dark matter has very different interactions to the visible matter. That means that you can separate them by looking at non-equilibrium systems where galaxy clusters are colliding with each other. So, how, how would this work? Well, let's think about how visible matter behaves when two galaxy clusters run into each other. And this is, you know, kind, kind of like taking like two big lumps of stuff and smooshing them into each other. Because that stuff has electromagnetic interactions, when you try to smoosh two clumps of gas or of liquid or of solid together, uh, they don't just pass straight through each other, they exert pressure on each other. If you're trying to compress gas into a small space, it will heat up. So if you run these two clouds of gas into each other, um, they, they will slow each other down, they will heat each other up, they may eventually pass through each other, but, that will, but it will leave uh, a wake in you know, what, what, you, they will leave wakes behind them and the shapes of the gas clouds will be deformed. So this is a picture of a bullet passing through water and you can see that the way that the water, and you, see, you can see that it develops this wake structure which you can observe and you can see, ah, something has moved through the system. So we've observed clusters like that, which we believe have the, that we believe have had have undergone recent collisions. And the most famous one is this one called the bullet cluster. So these red clumps here are regions of hot gas that have been observed in X-ray observations, and we believe that the reason that they look like this, the reason why this one has this distinctive you know, bullet shape, is because it's just gone through the other one. But what about dark matter? We just said dark matter has no interactions except gravity, which is very weak. So if you have two clouds of dark matter and they pass through each other, they'll just fly straight through. No wakes, no pressure, no stopping. So what would that look like? So this is a cartoon of what that would look like. So here the blue represents the non-interacting dark matter and the red represents the visible matter that does have interactions. 
So they start out with the blue overlapping with the red, but when they collide with each other, the blue clouds will just pass straight through. In the meantime, the red clouds, they slow down, they heat up, their shapes deform. And so what you should see after the collision is that if we can map out where the blue matter is, which we can do by looking at its gravitational uh, attraction on, on, uh, on other objects, then it should be in a different position to the visible matter, to the red matter. And that is indeed what we see. What this um, last slide is, is actually an observation of the bullet cluster. Again, these red regions are regions of glowing hot gas. The blue regions are maps of where the gravity of the cluster is strongest. And you can see that they're actually displaced from each other. So the gravity is not where most of the visible mass is. So, and this is, this is another picture, the same thing. So this was done just in 2006 by astronomers down the road at Harvard. Um, Clau et al. showed that the, re yeah, that the regions of strongest gravity in the bullet cluster do not coincide and are well separated from the regions where all the visible matter is concentrated. So that's very hard to explain by just modifying gravity, by like just saying the gravity of these red regions is different as you move out to, to larger distances. Um, so this is kind of a smoking gun that there's some component in this system which is in, in addition to the visible matter that we can see and we call that dark matter. And it's consistent with having either no interactions or pretty weak interactions with other dark matter particles. Okay, so the other, so that's sort of our evidence for dark matter in the universe today. But actually we have another really strong piece of evidence that tells us a lot about the properties of the dark matter that comes from when the universe was much, much younger. So the universe at present is about 14 billion years old but we actually have observations of the universe from when it was only three or 400,000 years old. Like, this is amazing to me. We can look back 14 billion years back in time with our telescopes. So what did the universe look like when it was three or 400,000 years old? Well, basically it was an almost homogeneous sea of photons and electrons and protons and neutrinos, and we think also dark matter. So there were no stars, there were no galaxies, there were no planets definitely no humans. We were still a long time in the future at this point. So I said almost homogeneous. So you know, most places you look in the universe that you, you would just see this seething bath of particles and light. It was very hot. The temperature of the universe was about um, 3,000 degrees Kelvin. So it was, um, it, it was not a hospitable place for, for anyone to live. But in this bath, there were little ripples. There were regions where the density was a little bit higher than in other regions. And if you have a situation like that, if you have a region where there's a bit higher density than other regions, then the effect of gravity is that it will cause that overdensity to grow. Particles will be attracted to that region of higher density, it'll get bigger and bigger. But there's a countervailing force which pushes against that, which is that as you try to cram more and more charged particles and photons together, they'll push each other back apart and that's called radiation pressure. So in this bath, there was this series of ripples across the sea of the universe driven by gravity on one hand and radiation pressure on the other. You can think of this as like the um, particles being like balls on a spring with the, um, with, with the countervailing effects. So oscillating in a potential well that's formed by the gravity, the objects around them, but experiencing this force from radiation pressure at the same time. What we now, when at the universe went through this epoch, at right around 400,000 years, the temperature of the universe dropped to the point that instead of the electrons and protons being separate particles, they started to form into atoms and coalesce into neutral hydrogen. And at that point, these, the photons, photons love to scatter on electrically charged particles. They don't like to scatter on neutral particles nearly so much. So at this point when the universe was three or 400,000 years old, what we call the epoch of last scattering, the photons were suddenly released. The universe went from being ionized to being neutral and the, all the photons that had been trapped in this bath were released to stream forward in time. And those are the photons that we see in our telescopes today when we measure what we call the cosmic microwave background radiation. These are photons that have been flying through the universe for 14 billion years and the first thing they've hit, since they were released from this sea of particles in the early universe, the first thing they hit is our telescopes. So, that way, so we can get a picture of what these ripples looked like in the early universe and it looks like this. This is a map of the sky produced by the Planck collaboration of the European Space Agency and these uh, blue and yellow regions are basically showing regions of slightly higher and slightly lower density and temperature. 
So using maps like this, using results like this, we can learn a lot about how that bath worked in the early universe. And the physics is, is actually very simple. Now, what I just showed you on the previous page, this map, you know, this is pretty complicated. But we can summarize it. We can just ask, OK, how much, how much uh, pow these fluctuations, these ripples, how, how much power is there in the ripples on different scales? So how many like very small, how many ripples on very small scales are there? How many sort of oscillations that cover the whole sky are there? And that allows us to build up what we call a, a power spectrum. So this is essentially showing how much power there is in oscillations at different scales. And the physics of this is the physics of a harmonic series. It's like the whole universe is ringing, like it was struck by a tuning fork. The, this first peak corresponds to the distance that, se that sound could travel in the early universe. The second peak corresponds to the first harmonic of that, and, and so on and so forth. So we can. So we can condense the information in the previous plot down to an image like this. It tells us about the size of the universe at that early period. And it also tells us about the structure of these ripples. And it turns out that the structure of those ripples, I told you that it depends on the interplay between gravity and radiation pressure. That means that it gives us a measure of how, much, of how strongly the matter felt gravity versus how strongly it felt radiation pressure. So the first thing you might do is say, right, OK, we know how ordinary matter interacts. It's made of protons and electrons and neutrons. We understand that. Um, if we just had ordinary matter and a bath of photons, then what should this pattern look like? And it's totally wrong. It's completely discrepant with the data. It turns out that what fixes that problem is that if you allow there to be an extra component of matter that doesn't feel radiation pressure, that only feels gravity, so when, it's, when you have a region of higher density, this kind of matter collects onto that region of higher density and is not pushed back apart. That component allows you to match the data. So we're going to show an animation here. This is the same like, power spectrum plot that I was showing you earlier. This purple bar shows how much, um, how much matter there is in the universe. So this, the level at the moment corresponds to what it would be if there was only visible matter. Then as you increase the amount of matter by adding dark matter, the whole structure of this power spectrum changes. The whole structure of these ripples in the early universe change. And it turns out that for one particular value of this pink bar, then we get an extremely good match to the data. That corresponds to needing some component of matter that feels gravity, but not radiation pressure, that has about five times as much mass in total <laughs> as the ordinary matter. And so now we have this apparently coherent story between in galaxies and clusters today. We see evidence that galaxies are embedded in giant halos of some non-interacting matter. From the very early universe, from the cosmic microwave background, we find that there was some component of matter that didn't feel radiation pressure and did experience gravity. And this is consistent with being about five times more abundant than the ordinary matter. So that, our hypothesis, our hypo the dark matter hypothesis is that these effects are all due to the same thing, and it's there's some component of matter in the universe that's about five times more abundant than the ordinary matter. There's another link between this very early universe, these very early universe data and what we see in galaxies today, because we believe that those ripple, we believe that those ripples in the cosmic sea that we see in the cosmic microwave background radiation they actually seed galaxies at later times. Once the photons have been released from the plasma, and once all the visible matter is locked up in hydrogen and helium atoms, then those um, regions of overdensity can start to grow. Gravity causes more and more matter to accrete onto them. They get larger and larger. And that eventually builds up the structures that we see in the universe. These figures on the right are showing simulations of what happens as a result of these ripples in the early universe growing. The earliest time is at the bottom, and as you go forward in time, you move up. These panels on the left are showing what's happening to the dark matter, and these panels on the right are simulations of what happens to the visible matter as a result. So the picture here is that the dark matter forms this filamentary cosmic web structure that gets more and more well-defined as time goes on. And the visible matter, which after all is just a very subdominant component of the universe, follows the dark matter. It is attracted to regions where there's a lot of dark matter and hence a lot of gravitational interaction. And that's what builds the galaxies. So in this sense, dark matter is the scaffolding for everything that we see out in the sky. It is the invisible backbone behind the visible universe. Now, 
This also tells us something else about dark matter, because in order for this to work, the dark matter needs to be pretty cold and slow moving. If the dark matter was whizzing around the universe at the speed of light, it would never form this filamentary web-like structure, and you wouldn't form galaxies as a consequence. So that tells us that the dark matter has to be pretty cold and slow moving. It can't be what we call hot and fast moving. This, incidentally, tells us that neutrinos can't be dark matter. You, because you know, everything I've told you so far, you might be like, well, but we do know of particles that don't really have electromagnetic interactions that are neutral. Um, they're called neutrinos. Why don't they work as dark matter? And uh, there are two answers. One is that we can work out an upper limit on how much mass there is in neutrinos, and it's not enough to explain all the dark matter. But the other is that if neutrinos were all the dark matter, they would never form a structure like this. They're just too fast moving. They would fly straight past each other. And uh, our universe, the visible universe, wouldn't look like it does today. So this brings us to a point where we have in my field what we call the standard model of particle physics, which is all the particles that we know about. It's been spectacularly successful to date, but there's nothing in it that works as a possible dark matter candidate. We need a particle that's stable on cosmological timescales. It was around when the universe was 400,000 years old, and they're still around today. It can't be, have electric charge of any kind, and um, it, can't, it has to be pretty slow moving. It can't be really fast moving. And that eliminates every possible particle that we know about. So that means that dark matter is one of the most powerful pieces of evidence for physics beyond the particles that we know about today. And as a theoretical physicist, that's really exciting because to, you know, to make progress, we need clues like this. But it's also true that absolutely everything I've told you so far about dark matter comes from looking at its gravitational effects. So if you give theoretical physicists a problem like this, and 50 years, what happens is something like this. <laughs> so this is a sketch from a colleague of mine that called Tim Tate, which was ideas for what dark matter could might, might be. And basically, everything within the red circle is possible ideas for dark matter. And everything outside that is um, bigger mysteries in particle physics that dark matter might connect to. Now, I definitely do not want you to try to understand everything on this slide, because we would be here for another several hours, at least. But I want you to take away a couple of things from this. One is, our problem is not a shortage of ideas for dark matter. We have, we have a lot of ideas for new particles that could potentially explain this behavior. Dark matter could be connected to some fundamental new symmetries of the universe. Our universe could have extra dimensions beyond the three space dimensions and one time dimension that we see. Dark matter could be some kind of excitation into those dimensions. It could be connected to the Higgs boson. It could be connected to the mystery of neutrino mass. It could be connected to other deep problems in the standard model called the strong CP problem, if any, um, that's, that's kind of a technical point, but it's something that puzzles particle physicists a lot. Dark matter could have its own interactions. It could have its own version of electromagnetism. It could be our only channel onto whole new dark sectors of the universe. Um, so dark matter could be a key to unlock a lot of doors. But at the same time, everything on this plot is currently consistent with the data that we have about dark matter. <laughs> Because everything on this plot has mass and hence gravity. And none of them, like by construction, have large enough interactions that we would already have necessarily seen them. So if you want to be able to distinguish between dark matter candidates, if you want to be able to eliminate some of these possibilities or find the one that is right, unless you get very lucky, you probably have to find some, non some evidence of non-gravitational interactions of dark matter. Although by or at least exclude the possibilities of non-gravitational interactions of dark matter. That would allow you to eliminate a lot of these possibilities, too. OK, so how can we proceed? So yeah, this is what I just said. So how can we proceed in trying to look for non-gravitational interactions of dark matter? I already told you that they're pretty weak. So how, how can we look for them? How, and I hope that tells you why we should look for them, because it would let us distinguish between these different possibilities. But how do we go after them? Well, let's think about how dark matter might interact with visible particles. So this is an example of one classic possibility for how dark matter might interact with visible particles. It's not guaranteed. So now we come to the light side of the, of the talk, by the way, having finished the dark side bit. So um, 
so, th so this is one possibility, that when two dark matter particles collide, it might be possible for them to produce visible particles. Just as we at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, we smash visible particles together with the hope of making new particles that we can look for. Dark matter particles, um, if dark matter is a particle, those particles are crashing together all the time out in space. If there's some interaction between the dark matter and the standard model, then when two dark matter particles collide, this is the step where a miracle occurs, this is the new physics that we would like to understand, then visible particles could be produced. We know how visible particles behave, so if they produce unstable particles, they'll decay and make radiation, photons, electrons, positrons, protons, antiprotons, neutrinos. We can look for those particles. If these collisions are happening all the time out in space, our telescopes can look for particles popping out of apparently nowhere in regions of high dark matter density. OK, so, and in particular, I want to tell you in this last bit of, in this last bit of the talk about searching for, these, for particles like this in gamma rays. So gamma rays are the most energetic form of light. If the dark matter is heavier than the other particles that we know about, then when two dark matter particles collide and make light, the light should be up in the gamma ray band. So this is sort of a, this is just a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. The light from the lights in this room, if we turn it on, would be in the visible band. Uh, gamma rays have energies a billion times greater than the light that comes from that exit sign, for example. Uh, we deal with radio light, microwave light, infrared, that's heat. Uh, all the time in our everyday lives, as we worry about ultraviolet coming from the sun, we have x-rays in our medical procedures. Gamma rays are higher energy than all of these. They're the most energetic um, light in the universe, and they originate in violent high energy events occurring in our galaxy and in other galaxies. And they could be produced by dark matter collisions. So the problem when you're looking for light, for light from dark matter collisions is how do you tell it apart from all the other sources of gamma rays? So let's talk about those other sources of gamma rays for a moment. So the main way that you make gamma rays in our galaxy is from collisions of cosmic rays. If you have a proton, just an ordinary hydrogen proton flying through our galaxy, occasionally a high energy cosmic ray proton will hit it. That makes particles called pions. And these pions, if they're neutral, can decay about 99% of the time into gamma rays. So this process, protons collide, make pions, make gamma rays, is how most of the gamma rays in our galaxy are produced. Now, so the ingredients for this, you have cosmic ray protons. They're, they form like a sea of charged particles throughout our galaxy that's roughly uniform. The particles that they're hitting are the gas clouds in our galaxy. Those are mostly distributed in the disk part of our spiral disk galaxy. If we look at a map of where the gas is in our galaxy, so this is a map of the whole sky that has been projected out onto this rectangle, like projecting a map of the Earth onto a rectangular map. The coordinate system is such that this band along the middle is the disk of the galaxy, so it's the same of that stream of stars that I showed you early on. And the very center of this image is the center of our galaxy, which has a giant black hole at it, among, uh, among other things. So white here means bright means more gas, red means fainter gas, black means the least gas. So you see that there's this bright band of emission along the plane and then uh, less emission off the galactic plane. So we expect the gamma rays coming from cosmic rays hitting the gas to more or less look like this picture. So this is a first estimate of what the backgrounds look like. If we want to look for a dark matter signal, we want to look for something on top of this. So. How do we look for this? Well, we need telescopes that can see gamma rays. Most of my work that I've done with this has relied on public data from the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. This is a joint project of NASA and the US Department of Energy. It was launched from Cape Canaveral in June 2008, and this is a picture of the rocket when it went up with the spaceship on it. It's been in low Earth orbit ever since at 340 mile altitude. It goes around the Earth about every hour and a half and it scans the entire sky every two orbits. So about every three hours, we get a new picture of the sky from Fermi. It's sensitive from gamma rays. These are the units that are, um, gamma ray astronomers use from 300 mega electron volts up to several tera electron volts. One electron volt is about the energy of the light coming off this exit sign. So this is a mega electron volt is a million of those. Tera electron volt is a trillion of those. So th this is the kind of range that we're looking at. All the data is public. Any of you can download it at any time and play with it if you want. Uh, I'm not a member of the, collab the experimental collaboration here, so I have also benefited from the ability to download this data and explore it. So if we take that data 
If we take that gamma ray data and we make the map of the sky, just like the map of the sky I showed you on the previous slide, we get something that looks like this. And at first glance, you say, OK, this, this looks pretty reasonable. This band across, so here, black means more gamma rays, white means less gamma rays. So we, we see this band of bright gamma rays across the sky lining up with the Milky Way galactic plane, which is what we expected from all the gas there. And we can subtract off a simple model of the gamma rays based on that gas map that I showed you earlier. What's left when we do that is something that looks like this. Now, there are a few features in this image, but the one that my collaborators and I noticed when we did this first, which was about a decade ago when the data first came out, we noticed that there seems to be a sort of figure eight shaped structure in the middle of the map. And so that's sketched in red. These are structures called the Fermi bubbles, which we are my, when I was a grad student at Harvard, my advisor and my fellow grad student Meng Su described back in 2010. So this is not actually the puzzle I'm, this is an ongoing puzzle, but it's not the final puzzle I want to tell you about. These structures are called the Fermi bubbles. They're huge. I mean, as you can see, they extend over a significant fraction of the map of the sky. They're about 50,000 light years from top to bottom. Um, they're bright in gamma rays between about one and 100 billion electron volts. And we also see counterparts in X-ray and in microwave photons from this same region. Our best guess is at the moment is that either these bubbles were blown out by some eruption from the black hole at the center of, from the giant black hole at the center of the galaxy, or by many stars exploding and going supernova in the region around the galactic center over the last several million or several tens of millions of years. So, this, this has nothing to do with dark matter, I should be clear. This is, we started out by looking for dark matter. What we found was you take off the first background and you find this other, much more interesting background. Um, but for dark matter purposes, this is a background. And, uh, but, but this will, can potentially give us insight into what's been going on in the center of our galaxy over the last tens of millions of years. Oh, sorry. So this is galactic archaeology. But you might still say, OK, like that, that's very interesting. But I was looking for dark matter in this image. You know, what, what happened to the dark matter? So if we want to do a dark matter search, you might say, OK, what, what should a dark matter signal look like? I told you that we should look for annihilation signals in regions where there's a lot of dark matter. And we believe that, the dark, that there's more dark matter at the galactic center than anywhere else in the galaxy. Again, just because it interacts by gravity, the galactic center is the center of the gravitational potential well, the dark matter will naturally be attracted into it. So you might want to look at the center of the galaxy. And more generally, if you can see more of the dark matter signal, you'd expect it to look like this halo, which is roughly spherical or maybe football shaped, rather than looking like that band of the Milky Way disk across the sky. So if you see something that's more circular or more egg shaped, that can be a signal that you might be looking at something from dark matter. The other thing that you can do is look at the dependence of the photons with energy. So this is a plot of how much power there is in photons at a given energy as a function of the energy in giga electron volts for different models of dark matter annihilating, making standard model particles, which then decay, producing gamma ray photons. And all I want you to take away from this is that all of these lions basically correspond to a bump at a particular energy. The reason that they correspond to a bump is because the dark matter has a definite mass and the mass of the dark matter, when it converts its, it converts its mass into energy in annihilation via E equals mc squared, that tells you a characteristic energy for the particles that come out. So, so OK, so if we're looking for a dark matter signal, we might want to look for something that's roughly spherical, not following that line across the sky that corresponds to the Milky Way, and that in terms of energy has a bump-like spectrum. So do we see something like that? Well, we can look in the region right around the galactic center, and we can ask that question. And that question was asked in 2009, and it turns out that the answer is yes. Uh, so this is, again, a plot on the left-hand side. This is a plot of what the data looks like. So now red is more gamma rays, green is intermediate, blue and purple are the least. So this is the sky around the galactic center before you subtract off backgrounds. And again, you see this horizontal stripe along the sky. You subtract off our best model of those backgrounds. And what you're left with is this kind of fuzzy blob in the middle. Now, you might look at, now this is no longer a map of the whole sky. This is a map of just the region around the galactic center. And so when I and other people first saw these images, we went, oh, this is just a spot right at the center of the galaxy. It's probably got something to do with the black hole. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with dark matter. But then, in subsequent years, my collaborators and I actually showed, you can't really see it on this image, but this blob extends out much further 
than you can see on this image, just the color scale is hiding it. It goes out to about 5,000 light years from the galactic center, which is far outside the region where the black hole's signal should be showing up. And it's approximately spherical out to that region. It doesn't look like the plane of the galaxy at all. And it has a bump with the, the energy spectrum is a bump with a peak energy around, around two giga electron volts. And you can do even better than that. You can say, OK, let's take my standard dark matter models and ask how bright the signal should be in these. In a lot of models, there's a very tight prediction for how big the annihilation rate should be. And it nails the normalization of this bump dead on. So that's, I mean, th this was pretty exciting to us that maybe we have, that maybe we're looking at a dark matter signal. And it's, it's, it's possible. I mean, this is, an this is an open question. This could be still our first indication of non-gravitational interactions of dark matter. Or it could be something else. So the hypothesis here, hypothesis one, it's the one I've been leading you up to, is dark matter annihilation. Not wearing my particle theorist hat, this would be super exciting. I mean, this would be our first indication of the true identity of the stuff that makes up 80% of the matter in the universe. However, whenever you see something, especially in a complicated region like the galactic center, you need to think about the, the possibility that maybe we're seeing something else. So the other possibility is what particle physicists call conventional astrophysics, by which they mean any kind of astrophysics that doesn't actually require coming up with brand new particles. So. Mm -hmm. And astrophysicists might say, well, th this can still be pretty exciting. So the possibility, the leading possibilities here are that maybe what we're looking at is some new population of bright stars that are emitting in gamma rays that are distributed with this spherical distribution rather than along the plane of the galaxy. Or the other possibility is that there's been some kind of big outflow or burst of energy from the galactic center like the one that formed the Fermi bubbles, but which is forming this spherical structure instead. Wearing my particle theorist hat, this would be a little disappointing because it's not dark matter. For, for, for wearing my astrophysicist hat, this would be super exciting. I mean, either of these would tell us something really interesting about what's going on in the most complicated and energetic part of our galaxy. So what is it? I'm, I, so my personal feeling is that this option and this option are significantly better than the diffuse background options. And I can talk more about that in the Q&A session if people are interested. So I'm mostly just going to focus on this new population of stars possibility. So, what kind of stars are we interested in here? Well, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope has actually been a fantastic machine for discovering what are called pulsars. So these are spinning neutron stars. They're ultra dense, very compact little objects. Um, they, they, um, they, as they spin around, they emit a beam of energetic radiation. That beam can show up in radio and X-ray observations and also in gamma rays. And if you look at the pulsars that we've seen with Fermi and you ask, what does their spectrum look like in gamma rays? It looks like a bump. It looks very much like a dark matter annihilation spectrum, despite the fact that this like, clearly has nothing to do with dark matter. So how do we tell the difference between, I've just told you, OK, they both have a bump spectrum, so it's hard to tell the difference between, because of that. So how can we tell the difference between the possibility that this blob, that we're, this blob of emission that we're seeing in the galactic center is dark matter versus pulsars? Well, one thing that you can do is basically ask how grainy the signal is. So this is a cartoon where if we were looking at a dark matter signal that comes from many tiny subatomic particles colliding with each other and annihilating, then along every direction that you might look towards the galactic center, there should be dark matter in the way. There's no reason to think that there should be sort of holes in the dark matter distribution. So we would expect there to be this glow to be fairly smooth, fairly even. I mean, it would get brighter towards the galactic center, but basically it should look like that sketch of the cloud of dark matter around the galaxy that I showed you earlier. On the other hand, if we're looking at pulsars, they're individual stars. It should look like a scattering of bright stars on the night sky. And so at first you might say, oh, come on, Tracy, this, why is this even a question? When I look at the sky, I can tell the difference between a bunch of stars and a cloud passing between the stars. Like one is diffuse, one is a bunch of points. They're not that hard to tell apart. But the thing is that gamma ray telescopes like Fermi, uh, measuring these photons is already pretty difficult. And telling exactly where they came from is pretty hard. So Fermi sees a much blurrier view of the sky than anything that you could see with the naked eye. It's uh, Fermi resolved, 
Fermi will take any star in the sky and smear it out to a blob that's about the size of the moon or the sun. So if you imagine looking at the sky with you know, real, really blurry glasses, got a lot of mud smeared over them such that every individual star looks the size of the moon, then it might not be so easy to tell the difference between a cluster of stars and a cloud pass it, passing in between. So that's the difficulty that we have to deal with. That's why it's hard to tell by eye. Also, as I said earlier, there's, there's all those bright gamma rays from the plane of the Milky Way galaxy getting in the way as well. So that also makes it more difficult. So nonetheless, we, my collaborators and I developed a statistical analysis to try to tell the difference between these two possibilities. And we ran this analysis in 2015. And what the analysis said was, well, you do this analysis, and we're pretty sure it's a cluster of stars not a cloud of dark matter. So this is, and the, okay, so I'll get just slightly more technical. This is what the actual outputs from the analysis look like. These plots are showing the probability that a certain fraction of the gamma rays in the inner galaxy are attributed to a given um, component, a given possibility. So this first, this panel here is the first time we did the fit. Here, red corresponds to dark matter. Um, blue corresponds to stars along the disk of the galaxy. Green corresponds to um, stars in other galaxies. And this is a fit where we didn't allow there to be any population of point sources looking like the excess, so we're like definitely can't be stars, has to be a cloud. In that case, you see that the dark matter makes up about 7% of the total gamma rays in this region. Then the larger panel is what happens when we do exactly the same thing, but we allow for the possibility that there's a cluster of stars, of pulsars in this region. Now the red part is still the dark matter, but the orange part here is the stars. And what you find is that then the fit wants to attribute about 7% of the flux to the stars and basically nothing to the dark matter. So that was the result from 2015. Statistics say no dark matter, all pulsars. OK, so we've discovered a new pulsar population. That, that's not such a bad thing. That's it. I told you that this was still an open puzzle, still an ongoing question. So yeah, particle theorist is sad with this outcome. but. Uh, but earlier this year, my collaborators and I, uh, my collaborator Rebecca Lean and I took another look at this and we found that maybe, that, um, maybe it's a little bit more complicated than that. And given my earlier Star Wars theme, I uh, have to stick with this title. So um, that, maybe it could, that maybe there could be a dark matter signal here after all. Because the statistical technique that we developed relied on having a pretty good model of these background gamma rays that I told you about earlier. And if it's not good enough, then it could be that you know, you, what you're seeing is really something like this plus something like this, but because your model for this part is bad, you misidentify the dark matter signal as something that looks like a bunch of hot spots and cold spots, and hence like stars. And uh, what we, so the, the simple version of this analysis, what we did was we said, okay, let's take the real data, let's add a, an imaginary dark matter signal on top of the real data, then let's run our analysis again and check that it can find that dark matter signal. So if we give the fit a dark matter signal, let's check that it can get it back out. Um, and it turns out that it can't. <laughs> that, uh, when you, um, that when you uh, inject an extra dark matter signal into the real data, the analysis says 100% stars, definitely not dark matter, no dark matter here. And this continues until you inject an amount of dark matter that is about five times larger than the whole excess blob that we're seeing. This isn't because we don't know how to do statistics. It's, I mean, like we check the statistical method on cases where the background is modeled correctly. This signals that there's something going wrong with um, our modeling of the background emission associated with the gas. So maybe the dark matter explanation is not quite dead yet. So although, yeah, as I said, this is an open puzzle. When we gave talks with the title Dark Matter Strikes Back, people came over to us afterwards to go, but you realize the Empire loses in the third movie. So <laughs> it's possible that that will be the outcome of, of this story as well, and that in the end it will be pulsars. So I'm not going to give you any answers on that question. I'm just going to leave you with that open puzzle. So just to sum up, dark matter is more than 80% of the matter in the universe, and we don't know what it is. That's the basic problem that many scientists, including me, are working on and trying to resolve. We know some things about it. We know that it has to be pretty cold and slow moving, that it has to be fairly weakly interacting, that it's not made of protons or neutrons, and that it forms these large halos around galaxies and the scaffolding for the whole visible universe. One promising way for finding non-gravitational signatures of dark matter is to look at particles that could be produced by dark matter collisions and their subsequent effects. We probably have not yet found dark matter through this search strategy, 
But the techniques that we developed to look for it have led us to discover the Fermi bubbles, which allow us to do galactic archaeology. And we may have discovered an unexpected new population of pulsars of spinning neutron stars at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, so stay, stay tuned as to where this story goes. But um, even if this one doesn't pan out, there are many other ways to search for dark matter and new data coming in all the time. So uh, it's a very, it's a, I feel very privileged to be allowed to work on this stuff. So thank you very much for listening.